Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today is Norman Jordan. He is the color commentator for Vanderbilt football, also a former Commodore football player. Today's episode, presented by the Well Coffee House, which turns coffee into water. The Well is a coffee house with a mission to bring clean water to the world. To date, over 30 communities across the globe have access to safe water, health, and hope. You can make an impact by visiting a Well Coffee House location today. There are four area locations. You can find those in Brentwood, Green Hills downtown, and Bellevue. You can also get more information at wellcoffeehouse.org, the Well Coffee House, where coffee changes lives. We thank our co-sponsor, Wellspire, Nashville's Learning and Development Center, which is located in the Gulch. Our news today, presented by Sutherland and Belk, a local injury law firm committed to helping those injured in accidents, If you know someone who's been in a wreck or another accident, reach out to them to see what your rights are. You can get their contact info online at sbinjurylaw.com. Vanderbilt has a football game with Northern Illinois on Saturday. If you're watching from TV, you can find that on the SEC Network. Kickoff is 11 a.m. Central. Dave Neal will be on the call. Our guest line presented by Bolin Branch, started by Vanderbilt graduates Scott and Missy Tannen. I've slept on Bolin Branch sheets for over five years now. They are phenomenal. I had no clue what I was missing until I got them. The sheets are also fair trade certified. That means they're made under safe conditions by men and women treated and paid fairly. Try them for a month. You can return them for free, but you're not going to want to. Once you get the sheets, try the mattress. That was voted best mattress of 2018. Go to bowlandbranch.com. That's spelled B-O-L-L. Enter the promo code VANDY and get $50 off your first set of sheets. Norman Jordan joins us now. Norman is the color commentator for Vanderbilt football. He is a former running back for the 1982 Hall of Fame Bowl team. Norman, thanks for joining us. Hope you're doing well. Yeah, doing great, Chris. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about the LSU game. Your general thoughts on that, including maybe thoughts on how good LSU is. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I was I've watched enough film on LSU to know they had a really good offense. I didn't realize just how good they were. They may have three of the five best receivers in the conference. Uh, So they're they're really good. They're really fast. They're big. And Burrow, certainly a really good quarterback. And they're all on the same page. So when you have that, you've got a problem if you're playing those guys. Defensively, I think they got some issues. But they did have a couple of big guys out, so you you don't know how that's going to play. But it's a very good football team. i still not convinced they're fourth in the country, but I do think they're top five in the country. Yeah, I'm with you. I was not super impressed with their defense. Now, having said that, they were down more than a couple of guys and lost one of their key linebackers, Michael Divinity, during the game. They don't have a running game or a great one, although they ran the ball fine against Vanderbilt, so take that for what it's worth. Of course, a lot of people are doing that, but people have talked about how they're better than Georgia. I just think Georgia's a lot more balanced than they are. No, yeah, they're not for the very reason you just said that. Uh, Prom can come out, and if they have to have him do that, they don't want to have to have him do that. He can have that kind of game. But Georgia knows we've got to be balanced, that we can get you any way we want to get you. Sooner or later, we're going to wear you down. And that's the problem with the LSU. And, and look, my hat's off to those guys. They've done a wonderful job. What a great passing game. But if you have a receiver or two or a quarterback that has an off night, all of a sudden you're walking out with an L. And Georgia, that's harder to do because they're balanced. It's amazing. I'm going back and looking through it. I'm trying to to count it as we speak. But just there were so many more possessions in the LSU game than there were the Georgia game. It's just such a contrast of styles. Yeah, I mean, Georgia came in, and they'll do this all year long. I mean, Kirby Smart's playing the long game. He's playing the game that, look, I don't want to just compete for the title this year. I want to compete for the title 10 years from now. That's why he's doing what he's doing, and that's why he's going out and recruiting kids to that kind of game plan. Ed Orgeron, I think he he made just a great move in going out and getting one of the Saints coaches, and you know he just retooled the offense. 
these receivers are different. They they know what they're trying to do, and they know when there's a read what to what to do with it. And so they're on the same page with Burrow. So that that's why they're playing so well. Well, I'm looking back at the possessions, and I'm not counting the end of half drives. There were ten possessions in the Georgia game and seventeen in the LSU game for Vanderbilt. Yeah, you know, like I say, that's the long game. That's if I keep their hands off the ball and I have long drives and just take it to the house at the end of it or just get a field goal, I'm, I'm going to go out and win the ball game. That's why you saw a 30-6 to six game versus a 56-38 a to 38 game. Let's start with the defense. I am just now getting a chance to go back and watch it again. I've wa- I have watched bits and pieces. Derek Mason, I'm not going to say he took exception to the – question in the post game that they didn't get after the quarterback enough but he certainly disputed that a little bit said they called 20 to 25 zero pressures that's a man coverage basically blitz uh, and I'm going back and watching like in one play they did hit Burrow with two defenders right after he got rid of the ball and he lofted it up his receiver made a terrific play in one-on-one so I think it was one of those things where they did seem to get some pressure some it was just a lot of the times when they didn't, he made the plays anyway. They did. They truly blitzed a lot, but it got picked up really well. And I think that's why this is a, a different LSU team. They're picking up the blitzes. And, and you know, the, the purpose of the blitz, in my mind, uh, and I never played quarterback, but I sure am good friends with the guy who did. And the purpose of that is get them out of the rhythm, to get them a little bit jumpy, and, and until you can hit that guy three or four times and get him off his mark three or four times, you're not getting him jumping. Yeah, well, they didn't do anything to get him out of his rhythm, which is a credit to him. No, he, he, he's a really good quarterback. And it's also a credit to Ohio State that, you know, they've had all these quarterbacks come through here. And uh, this, this one happened to find his right niche. I almost feel like it's like uh, with Troy Aikman and going to Oklahoma and then say, no, really, we're going to throw the ball. And Aikman got there and they're going, uh, by throw the ball, we mean like 10 times a game. So Aikman said, well, I, I'm headed to the West Coast. Exactly. Speaking of picking things up, I'm I'm watching the block kick and I don't think they got a finger on that kid. No, they didn't. They didn't. There weren't enough people to pick it up. I mean, they over overloaded one side, and I've not looked at the play, but yeah, he came through clean and and take it from somebody who used to be the up back for Jim Arnold. When you look up and you see three guys coming clean, you got a problem. Getting to special teams for a minute. That's one thing to watch this week because I watched a little bit of Northern Illinois game against Nebraska. They were having trouble protecting their punter. But Nebraska was having trouble getting kicks blocked, too. Northern Illinois blocked three kicks this year. Vanderbilt, I suspect, is going to have a new place kicker, Jevin Rice, this week. That could be one thing, given they had a punt blocked last week, and that that could be something to really watch out for in that NIU game this weekend. Yeah, you're, you're one up on me there. I, I don't know how Riley is, so I guess he's hurt badly enough where he, he won't be kicking this week. I don't know for sure, but I think it may be like a sprained ankle, which is probably not the injury of choice if you're a kicker, I'm guessing. Either one. Right, Either right. Either the plant or the, the other one. Right. Miraculous things happen as you get closer to Saturday. The juices get flowing, and you don't want to be the guy that, that let Joe DiMaggio come in and play for you because you had a hangover. You know, you, you open the door one time, and you may not get the door opened up for you again. Well, I mean, on to that vein, I do wonder if somebody on the offensive line got Wally pipped because you've got all of a sudden, I'm not going to say an abundance of offensive tackles. That might be a little strong, but Cole Clemens played well there in the opener. Jonathan Stewart played pretty well on the left side two weeks in a row. I think you've had Tyler Steen play respectably. Now you get your best one back. I did ask Derek Mason about that today, and would they consider moving a tackle inside? And he he basically said, the, the way he answered it, I'm not going to say that they're going to do it, but it, it made me think that they maybe had. And I'm guessing if somebody moves inside, it's maybe Steen to guard. But 
that is one little blessing of this season is I think they found that they've got more serviceable offensive linemen than we expected. I'm, I'm very interested to see how that dynamic plays out between now and the end of the year. Yeah, I, I know absolutely nothing. I've, I've talked to nobody, but I, I would expect to see Sting move in. I don't think he's he's ready for where he is right now. You know, he played respect, respectably, but I, I think you get a real rush in that he's got an issue with it. it it's not athletic ability. It's just the natural feet. And after you do it enough times, it gets to be natural. So that's kind of what I would expect, but I have no idea. Yeah, well, I'm wondering how long does it take to move guys around? I mean, Tyler, obviously, he moved from offensive line and fall camp to defensive line pretty quickly. So I would think that that's easier moving tackle to guard. And again, this is just us speculating. I don't know what Derek would do, but in sizing up the guys that you would move, I would think that given he is run blocked better than he is pass blocked, you need that more at guard. You need pass blocking more at tackle. I'm just wondering how long would it take a guy like that to adjust to playing, say, moving one spot inside or or maybe, I don't know, I almost think that they might move him from right tackle to left guard because I think that Clemens is more solid on the right side than Sage Young is on the left. So hypothetically speaking, let's say that he hadn't been playing inside at all. How long would it take a guy like that to make a shift? It, it depends on how they've been coaching him, and I would suspect they've been coaching him to be able to make that shift inside. I, I don't know that again, but I would suspect that having played one year, I think my sophomore year, as both fullback and tailback, and you've got to know both positions, it, it's a little disconcerting simply because in the middle of the game, you have to kind of pinch yourself and put go right. So am I tailback or fullback right here? And, and you can learn it all. That's not the issue. The issue is, do you react? And, and that's where the tough part comes along. I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody. But well, no, um, it it totally yeah. does. And of course, you're also you you know if you play different sides of the ball, there's that as well. And I, I guess that's the other question: is how difficult would it be for Jonathan Stewart? I don't. I think the answer to this is probably not difficult because I think he has played right tackle in practice. I would think Stewart's been working a lot at left on the left side lately because of the Cochran injury, which happened about mid-August. So I guess it depends on how much time he's gotten on the right side. That's the other thing I'd like to know. If I'm pulling the trigger on this thing, it's not so much the pass blocking. I mean, you've got to have that. You see all the time where they're running backs that don't get playing time because they can't do the passing blocking. And so you can't let them in because it just tells you that it's a run. But I think you have to keep that option open all the time that you want your best running thing because you got Keyshawn Vaughn as your running back. And Keyshawn is a passing game. I mean, you you look at the 43-yard run, you look at the 50-whatever-yard run, that's a passing game right there. I mean, he's that good. And, And I will say this before I forget to say it. I look down after the game when the players go across and, you know, you usually go and find the guys you played against and all that and, you know, shake hands and good game, good game and all that. But the LSU defensive players were coming up to Keyshawn and this was not like good game stuff. This was like, man, you're real. You're good. I thought that his form, I mean, he was more back to it. He had two long runs. But that gets me into another thing. Their offense right now is really feast or famine. It is either they get a big play on a drive that he breaks or like you had the Chris Pierce touchdown a couple of weeks ago against Purdue. It seems like they either break one big play on a drive or they get nothing. I mean, they're three and outs right now. They're averaging about 35% on the year. They have some other drives that have been turnovers. It's really not been a pretty picture offensively for them consistency wise now Derek today said he thinks that the offensive line being contiguous and cohesive will solve a lot of their issues that's where he seems to think they're going to solve the issues I still would like to see them go up tempo the the answer he gave today did not indicate to me that they were going to but how much can a cohesive offensive line help them with their issues of consistency right now 
Oh, I think a ton. I, I really do believe a ton. Uh, if, if you're back there as a running back or you're back there as a quarterback or you're out there as a wide receiver and you believe that your quarterback's going to have time or your running back's going to have time, perception is a lot of this game. And if you really think that your people can block their people and take care of business long enough for you to run your route, it changes the complexion of the game. It changes the complexion of the team. So I, I really do think that that makes a big difference. And again, I've, I've talked about this time and time again. You're not looking for the five best blockers. You're looking for the, the chemistry of the five that played the best together. On defense, I thought he gave a coherent answer today about where their issues were. He thinks it is just guys maybe not trusting teammates, it sounded like to me. that, In other words, player A has an assignment and – he doesn't trust player B to do his job, so he may shade away from what he's supposed to do a little bit in order to to cover in case this guy screws up. And when you get a whole team of guys doing that, and I'm not saying that's the case, uh, but he did indicate this was sort of an issue. How much yeah, of that do you think is the issue right now? Trust is 100% the issue on both sides of the ball. If, for instance, I say to you, Chris, let's meet for breakfast tomorrow at 8 o'clock at such and such a place. And I show up, I'm, I'm building a little bit of trust with you. But if we do that for 10 days in a row or 10 weeks in a row, all of a sudden the trust is there. And a lot of these kids haven't played enough to know who they can trust and how they can trust them. And if you look, I mean, there were, there were two or three new faces out there getting a lot, a lot of snaps that were active and playing well. So trust comes with showing up time and time again. Well, once they get that resolved, what do you see as the the biggest issues? I mean, they, they still, I, I guess as I watch the film, I am encouraged to see them getting to the quarterback a little bit more. They, they just, in this case, ran up against an elite one that was good at getting rid of the ball. Uh, stopping the run, you know, I, I still don't think this is going to be a great defense in terms of doing that. What do you see as the other things that they really have to shore up? I think you're seeing some defensive backs. If, if you look at the first half, and I think Derek was a little surprised when he was interviewed after the game that, that it was brought up, but there was a lot of area between our corners and the guys making the catches, basically doing pitching and catching on sideline routes. Uh, the, the slant was there all day long. And so once we started closing in on it a little bit, it changed it some. But again, I, I really do think those guys were so fast that our guys didn't have the angles. If you look at the early early part of the game, our guys were taking angles that they shouldn't have taken. They should have taken an angle like it's a world-class sprinter. The chase play, the one where he scored their 37th point uh, was just like that. They had a, Boy, who was that? Jerkins took a bad angle, and then Mintz couldn't run him down from behind, and then uh, the safety, which on that play I think was Coppett, couldn't catch him either. I mean, I'm watching this just thinking, I don't know that I've ever seen, well, I shouldn't say ever, but you don't see a lot of teams get more yards after the catch than that team did. Yeah, and it wasn't yards after the hit. It was yards after the catch. Right. That, that's they, I mean, because the after was. they caught it, they were lucky to get a finger on them. Right. Right. That, that, I think that's where the real problem was that, you know, there was nobody around. And then you give that much space to that much speed, and it's going to hurt you really badly. And, I mean, it looked to me like I, I still to this day remember being 10 years old and having this guy break away in a little league football game and chasing him down and, and having the thought occur to me I can't catch him. And I think that thought went through a lot of these kids' heads for the first time. Georgia was that way too, but again, I don't know that the rest of the schedule, you got maybe, Missouri's probably going to have a couple of those guys. Florida will have a couple of those guys. Whether they get them the ball or not, I don't know. We'll have to see if the quarterback situation pans out. And South Carolina's always got one of those two. But, I mean, other than that, I don't know that there's a lot of those teams that are just going to have guys that get away from you left on the schedule. Yeah, when, when you got one of those guys, you can you can make that work. When you got three of those guys, you can't make that work. 
you got to have three shut down corners. And if you're a, you know, a good football team, you're lucky to have one shut down corner. Yeah, well, anyway, this is the reset portion uh, of the schedule. I mean, Derek Mason called it the second quarter today. They really did seem, when I saw them Saturday, I think that was one thing that struck me is that did not look like a team whose confidence had been wrecked. The other interesting thing today, and usually Derek is, Derek tends to believe in what Derek does, right? And if you ask him a question on a Saturday okay, would would you do this different? You ask him again on Tuesday, he usually sticks by his guns. I heard him say something interesting today, though, because he was asked about the DBs playing too far off the receivers, and Saturday he was adamant that no, that, that wasn't the issue. Today being Tuesday, his tune was different. He said, basically, we're going to have to tighten up our coverages a little bit. To hear him acknowledge that was an issue was sort of encouraging, I guess. With all due respect, I, I won't say playing the corners close is what you've got to do. You've you got to have the corners ready for something to happen in front of them. You know, I, I can play off of you seven yards, but I can still be ready for the slant and see you're going for the slant and break on the slant. I don't have to be right up in your face like, like you know, we had last year. We had somebody that could play up in the face. We don't have anybody like that, but I've got to know what might be coming here. That's really what he's trying to do is, you know, we don't have great cover corners at this point because they don't have enough reps to be great cover corners. They're kids that can be good cover corners, but you you got to see the really good players make their really good moves before you become great. Well, and there were times corners were 12 yards off the ball. And I think the thing... No, absolutely. Yeah, and I think the thing... And I get that there's some X's and O's things that I just am not going to understand, and coaches get that better than we do. But at the same time, you look at a play, and, and a corner's playing a guy 12 yards off the ball. The guy's catching the ball <laughs> over the middle field, and even spotting him all that space, he gets outrun. That's when you you have a problem. Yeah, no, 15 yards. I, I looked at there one time, and, and we had a corner 15 yards off of the guy that he was obviously covering. And I don't know if it's a bust or, or what. And guess what they did? They did a 12-yard out route. Oh, goodness. You know, but I, I literally looked at there going, he's 15 yards back. What, how do you cover somebody like that? What's the point of being that far off the ball? I mean, what is the advantage of that? I mean, now, if it's third and... 35, I understand that, but if it's not, which LSU was not in a situation for sure, that's the part that I've had an issue, and I think a lot of people have had a hard time grasping. Well, and and let me flip that around to the other side, and and if you look at it offensively, when we threw on first down and completed, it's a different offense than when we throw and have an, an incompletion. To the other side of the ball, maybe I would feel differently if I went back and watched a little bit more, but it just seems to me that they don't use the middle of the field enough in the passing game. Jared Pinkney. Yeah, well, who's not been enough of a factor. I'm at the point, and I don't know if I said this last week, but you've got three really good players. And I, I'm at the point where I'd love to see a count on how many times we go with those players. And if, if you go at Jared and he can't make the play or he can't get open and they're doing something to prevent that, all right, so maybe he doesn't get eight balls thrown to him. Then you adjust it and, and throw it over to Kalaja. Or if, if you can't get Keyshawn going, then get Keyshawn going with screen pass. You know, just make sure those guys touch the ball enough to where they're getting a fair chance to make something big happen. Do they have a quick slant to a wide receiver in the playbook, or is that just not something that they use? Yeah, they've run it uh, four times, I think. Okay. And three of the four were completed. When have, when uh, have they run that? I, I'm, not, I'm not thinking of when they did that. Purdue comes to mind and Georgia comes to mind. I can't remember if they did LSU, but uh, Riley makes a good throw on that. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's not going to break like it breaks for Purdue or like it, it broke for LSU. But, I mean, if that's your first down play and you pick up seven yards, 
life's pretty good. Right. And that's just been the issue for them. They've been living in second and nine, second and 11, just about the entire season. Yeah. And I think the other issue on the passing game is I I couldn't give you a count on how many times uh, Raleigh's had the ball blocked or tipped or whatever, but you know, you got a six, six quarterback. And if the passing lanes are open, the ball should never be tipped, but we're getting, you know, several tip passes. And once it gets tipped, you know, play over except interception. I'm going to go ahead and go to the mailbag. That is sponsored by Vanderbilt Fan and independent insurance agent Josh Minton of Brentwood. Do you need an insurance agent who wants to know your unique needs and circumstances and will tailor an insurance plan to fit them? Josh is your guy. Call him 615 933 1979. Email him at josh at hqinsurance.com. Follow him at facebook.com forward slash JD Minton HQ. He's my agent. Give him a shot. Think you'll be pleased. Mr. Vandy says, concerning the defense, is it on the players or the scheme and what can Mason do to help? Uh, I think it's the youth. I, th- I think they have players that are good enough out there. And I, I think it's in youth and injuries, and I'm not trying to make excuses for them, but there are guys that are getting some reps that we're not calling their names, that we're making a lot of tackles last year. And I think that goes back to what Derek was saying is, Maybe they're having to, to try to plug the gap for somebody else. Uh, and also, you know, I said said this last week, but you, you've got some guys uh, that are playing defensive back that aren't used to the game being this fast. The SEC is an incredibly fast league, and the, the quarterbacks have strong arms, and so you better be ready to not stop and jump, but just keep covering and then stop and jump. Well, here's here's what I think they start this week. Okay, they'll start Odingbo, who's a junior, Birchmeyer, who's a junior. They are now listing Davion Davis as a starter. He's a freshman. Mitz and Abair are your starters on the outside, redshirt juniors, but both first time starters really for a full season. Afimue inside, sophomore, peered inside, graduate student. Uh, senior, basically. I, I'd say they, like, you got two of those because you got Watkins outside. He's a grad transfer. But then you got Jerkins, who's a freshman, Daly, and he's the other safety. He's a junior. Williams is a junior at one corner, and Alan George at your nickel redshirt sophomore. So that's 12 starters if you include uh, the nickel. Yeah, well, I think you just put your, put your finger on the problem. Is uh, We need to have 12 out there. That always helps. I mean, it helped. It, it, it really would. You know, fifth downs and 12 guys, those kind of things tend to, to help struggling programs. Yeah. We, we want to do three downs and 12 guys. But, right. Let's, yeah. let's just make no, this no, Canadian it, football. <laughs> but, but, I mean, there, there are there are people that we called their name a lot last year that were not calling their name much this year. And until you just break it all down and see it all, you don't know why. Uh, guys that you know are capable, but it, it, it probably goes back to what Derek was talking about earlier is, you know, until I show up for that 10th breakfast tomorrow at 8 o'clock, then I, I don't have much trust there is. Next question comes from Ann Arbor Door. After a fumble that was ruled a dead ball, Keyshawn did 10 push-ups. Was that self-imposed? Is that a requirement from the coaches? No. Yeah. Totally self-imposed, and my comment when he did it, you better believe the pro scouts are seeing this. I mean, I, right. I was he, he was doing it in uh, in preseason, so I'm doing it a couple of times, and it's just as as a running back, and, and particularly at his caliber of running back, I'm very impressed with that. Obviously, I think a lot of him, I and mean, he's he's a great player, and I think a really good person, but. To do that is him just in the middle of the game reminding himself, you don't drop the football. And that, that comes from somebody that I, I knew if I had ever fumbled ever, that I probably wouldn't see the field again. Well, I think he's lost what won this year, although that was sort of a a botched handoff coming off a bad snap. I don't know who you really credit that one to. That was the Georgia game. I don't think he lost a fumble all last year that I remember. Do you? 
No, I, I don't think he did. And, and you know, that's, that's something you look for if you're an NFL scout. And for him to drop and do 10 push-ups right there in the huddle, if I'm an NFL scout that tells me he knows this is really important. Last one from Ann Arbor Door. In your playing days, how did coaches handle players who fumbled? You didn't play. I mean, it, it was real simple. I mean, you figured it out real early. I remember, Rob, uh, I, I may have said this story before, and pardon me if I did, but we had a rule my senior year where if, if anybody, any running back period fumbled, all the running backs had to show up at 5 o'clock in the morning the next day to watch film. And that gives you a reason not to fumble the football. I mean, I, I love my sleep when I was in college. I love it to this day. And I don't want to fumble the ball and make, you know, 14 other guys have to go over and be up at 5 o'clock. So it just it kind of it makes you understand that every possession that you've got is, is really pressure. And if you drop the ball, if you, if you drop the ball in high school, it doesn't matter. You were probably good enough to make up for it. If you drop it in college, that wipes one complete possession off the field. I heard this question asked this week somewhere else. Why is it so different for running backs? I mean, why, why do you get pulled for one fumble? You don't see a quarterback get pulled for one interception. Now, my guess is that interceptions are riskier. You just by the nature of the game, it's a harder thing to do than just hanging onto the ball. But it is interesting the difference in culture surrounding how players who fumble are treated versus players who turn it over in other ways. Well, I, I have if if I've got the football in my hand, I have total control of what goes on with that football. Short of somebody putting their helmet right on it and bouncing it out. So I've got total control, and even I have control then because I can see him coming and turn away from that. If I'm the quarterback and I'm back, the receiver might have cut out when he should have cut in, or he may may have run the wrong route, or the ball may have gotten tipped at the line of scrimmage, or gotten tipped by a linebacker, and you know it's out of my hands at that point. That's why it's so different in the way that they play the game today. Norman, anything else before we go that's worth discussing that we didn't get around to? Uh, no, I, I think what you brought up earlier is, is very accurate. And, and you know, I think, as you said, Derek alluded to it. You're going into the second half of the season. You played you know, two of the top four teams in the country. Uh, best case scenario, you walk out one and two. Uh, and, you know, and, and those teams really are good and, and produce a good football team. So right now you, you collect yourself, you get uh, Devin back, and you, you've got a more complete line and see what you can do going forward. And, you know, it's 0-3. Uh, all right, so we've got nine more. Can we get to you know, seven and five? I mean, what, what, what's the limit? And really there's not a lot of people on the schedule that you can go in as a prohibited uh, underdog at this point. Uh, that, that's where I would be as a player. Hey, thank you so much, Norman. Look forward to you joining us again next week. Thanks, Chris. He's Norman Jordan. I'm Chris Lee, host of the Vandy Sports Podcast. Thank you for listening. We'll be back again soon.